Amen, amen. You may be seated. Gary, if I could get some more volume on this, please. Thank you. Amen. Grab your Bible uh, tonight and turn to 1 Thessalonians with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, we are uh, one week away from our finale. Amen. And uh, I don't know about you, but it's been a good series. Amen. And um, uh, I can just feel that the Lord is using it to create uh, a deeper hunger in the house. And so we're thankful for that. Um, and so it's all just going to kind of culminate next Wednesday. Uh, we're going to go back to John chapter 11, where we talk about uh, what the importance of building a Bethany and what did that what did that turn into for Mary and Martha? And more importantly, what did that turn into for Lazarus? And next week, we're going to talk about the importance of who you're connected to. And so you don't miss next Wednesday. And then two weeks from tonight is our combined youth service where we'll be teaching on flowing in the prophetic and laying hands on all of our young people who've been coming back from uh, camp. All of our middle schoolers are at camp uh, with Dusty this week and, um, and some other helpers. And so... Uh, pray for them, and uh, I'm sure they're having a great week, and then this coming uh, week, because some of our high schoolers are going down to camp, and then so two weeks from tonight, uh, we're going to be uh, having a combined service. You don't want to miss that. Amen? All right, First Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, is where we want to begin. Uh, for those of you that might be newer or visiting tonight, we want to kind of get everybody up to speed. We're talking about some lessons that we're learning from the house of Bethany. Uh, where Mary and Martha were, and this is the house, the Bible says, where Jesus would find rest. And so uh, we are discovering the importance of having the activity of Mary and Martha in our lives. Martha and the ministry of Martha is what compels us to serve each other, to serve humanity. And the, Mary, and the ministry of Mary is what moves us to minister to Jesus uh, with with intense worship, amen. And so uh, that brings us to tonight, which is part twelve, which we've entitled "Handling His Presence with Care." Handling His Presence with Care. Look at First Thessalonians chapter five, uh, verses sixteen through nineteen. The Apostle Paul writes these words: "Rejoice always." Pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, and do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. We talked about this a few Wednesday nights ago. I want to dive back into that tonight as we talk about learning how to handle the presence of God and handling it properly with care much has been said over the years uh, that the holy spirit is a gentleman and so the holy spirit will not force himself on us the presence of god will not force himself on us but the presence of god comes into an atmosphere where he's welcome and so it is important not just that we recognize the presence of god but that we do not mishandle the presence of god and so what this is what we want to talk about tonight so i want to begin uh, by talking about the importance of handling the presence of God. Did you know that this is not the sole responsibility of the leaders of a church? That it is the responsibility of every one of us that we handle the presence of God with care. Uh, so we have to recognize, we've talked about this in the last several weeks, when the presence of God comes in, the, in a place, comes in the room. Last week we talked about uh, the desire that a visitation would turn into a habitation. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight, but understand that a visitation will only turn into a habitation when the visitation is handled correctly. Uh, and so I want to talk about learning how to handle his presence with care. Uh, so I want, I want you to write these four things. These four key components of handling the presence of God. If you're going to handle the presence of God with care, number one, do not ever take it for granted. Do not ever take it for granted. Now, this is a warning I think we need to heed, especially in a church like this where the presence of God comes in frequently. 
because um, there's an old saying that says familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, But there's also the danger of assumption. And the danger of assumption is I'm not I do not handle the presence of God with care if I just go to church assuming something will happen. But I cannot take it for granted. And oftentimes we take the presence of God for granted uh, with almost like a lackadaisical attitude. Uh, it, it's all right if I miss this week because I know that presence will be there next week. And so this is what we talk about mishandling his presence is when we just take it for granted. When we take for granted who he is, how he moves, and what he does in our lives. Every single time the presence of God moves in this place, I'm in awe. When I sit back and I look about what has happened in people's lives, it's just, it should, it should never be a thing of, well, of course. But it should be a, God, you're amazing. You would change somebody's life like that. And how many, how many understands if he changes your life, you'll change anybody's life. But only when you learn to not take it for granted. Never take it for granted. You know, I got a text this week. Is someone who had been kind of going through some things and they came to the altar Sunday morning when it was their moment and God touched them and God set them free. And uh, they just kept saying to me and several others about how their mind felt different and how they felt lighter. We should not take that for granted. I mean, you know, sometimes we take the presence of God for granted. We mishandle his presence when we develop spiritual amnesia. When we have forgotten where we used to be. But look what the Lord has done. Amen. Number two, do not rush him out the door. When the presence of God comes in in a powerful way, we mishandle it if we become in a hurry. Now, there's a balance to be made, and I know some people hate that word balance. But there's a balance to be had between not belaboring it, but not rushing it. Some people think the longer your service, the more God moved. I can tell you I've been in a, ser- I've been in a service for an hour And God did so much, the mind cannot comprehend what he did. And I've been in church for four hours, and God wasn't the one doing it. Man was keeping us there. But I can also tell you, on the flip side, I've been in a church service that lasted an hour, and God wasn't in the move. And I've been in a service where it lasted for multiplied hours. And the reason that it did is because God was doing so much, nobody dared move a muscle. And so when we learn that God does not operate by humanity's clock, and so therefore not to be in a rush, and I've told people this before, it bears repeating, if I'm going to handle his presence with care, then I should not cram my Sunday. Okay. Are you in this building with me? You know, well, well, pastor, you know, I want God to move, but he's got 90 minutes because I've got this to do today. Uh, What you need to realize is his presence needs to be the priority, not all the extra stuff. And and Sunday afternoon should turn into when God's done, then we're free to do whatever we want to do. Amen. And so handling his presence with care means when he comes in the room, don't rush him out the door. It would be like if a very important guest came to your house and you're like so excited that they're there. And you're like, sit down, sit down. You want something to drink? You want something to eat? Let's talk. We're so glad that you're here. And then an hour later, well, we sure do thank you by stopping by. But we see, we've got these other plans, so you need to leave. That guest will not be likely to return because they were not handled with care. Are you with me? Okay, now I'm just, I'm not beating you up. I'm just trying to encourage us to to not be in a hurry when God says, there's something I want to do. And, I, and I'll, I'll say I'm not even preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself. Uh, there was uh, two Sundays ago, uh, we had a powerful move of God here Sunday morning. And 
four times I said to myself, no more. We're out of here. I'm going to dismiss. And every time I would go to dismiss you, God was like, okay, now call this out. Now, and it was like, and it felt to me like the altar service that did not end. And it didn't even take that long. But, and there's a lot more to the story I don't have time to get into tonight. But we've also seen God do that. But it wasn't because I was like, oh, I, want, I just want to keep people here. God was saying, I'm not done with this. So when we learn to not be in a hurry, his presence is handled with great care. You know, it's kind of like if you're in a long-term relationship with somebody and you want to spend lots and lots of time with that person and then treat them like you're speed dating. I can't get no real people in here at all that knows what I'm talking about. That's it's kind of what some people treat God like. Like, the, we're, not, we're, not, we're not saying we just want a moment. We're saying long term, we want everything that you have for us. But um, daylight's a-wasting, right? So we cannot rush his presence if we're going to handle him with care. Number three. Oh, boy. How you handle his visitation will impact the length of his visit. So, do we want a good service, or do we want a move of God? Do we want a good time? Uh, my wife says it this way. Uh, now, this is going to disturb a lot of people's theology, it's a, but it's all right. My wife says this all the time. I don't ever want to leave church feeling good about myself. That's what my wife says. And, you know, some people say, well, there's no threat of that happening you know, around here. But, um, you know, the reality is, you know, that's kind of what we've turned. We say we want God to visit us, but at the same time, we also want him to visit so that he can tell us good, something good about us. But I have found a real visitation is not God telling me I'm good the way I am. A real visitation is him taking the scope of his word and shining on areas of my life that he's not pleased with so that I can grow up in him, I can mature in him, and I can be who I'm supposed to be. I can find my purpose in the house when I have a real visitation. You know, uh, you know, the, a funny conversation I have with Bishop Thomas, and I have every time he comes, is we'll sit down inevitably after the weekend of ministry, and we'll sit down on Monday to breakfast or to lunch, and I'll sit down and I'll say, and I'll just open up the pages. You know, some people think this is dangerous. I, I don't see it as dangerous. I see it as wanting to grow. I'll say, Bishop, talk to me. What did you see? What did you feel? What did you sense? Tell me what I need to fix, Right? And, you know, and Bishop is very Bishop. You're doing wonderful. This church is amazing. Kathy and I love coming here. The people are amazing. The culture is amazing. The atmosphere is amazing. I'm so proud of you. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. What is it that's not good? So then he does this move. And then that's when I get nervous. But I want him to tell me the truth. Right? And this last visit, he's looked at me and he goes, you know, I just can't think of anything. And I was like, praise Jesus. Amen. But had it had been the opposite, I'm, sit I'm ready to take notes. Because I want to become the best pastor I can be. I want you to be the best congregation you can be. I want us to be the best church we can be. Does that make sense? But this is kind of what we've turned his visit into, is we've turned it into, okay, Jesus, we're glad you're here. Tell us what you love about us. Tell us what's good about us. Tell us, you know we have sin, but it's okay because you understand our heart. And that's not what a visitation from God does. A visitation from God says, this is good, but this I'm not pleased with. This is what turns into altar calls. 
God loves you too much to leave you in the condition He found you in, so He'll shine the light of His Word on the very thing He wants to change. Amen? So how I handle His visit will determine how long He stays. One of the the best things um, Pastor Mark said to me, he's like, you know, we we love it every time we come. He goes, but I'm getting sick and tired of coming here for two and three days. He's like, man, I need a week. And so that's what I'm saying. When you handle, when you handle it correctly, the visit becomes a longer visit. And we've all had visits from people that lasted a little longer <laughs> than we were comfortable with the visit. Amen. We once had a family over for Thanksgiving. And they were so, we handled them correctly. Because, Greg, they were so comfortable in our house. They just kicked back and relaxed all day through the parade, through the dinner, through the meal. And then my wife at one point was like, well, it was great having you guys. And then they were like, thank you so much for having us. You got coffee? And my wife was like, oh, geez. Just when I thought the visit was over. And so then it turned into, could we stay the night? (laughs) Okay, sure. You know, um, because I'm a nice person. I was a bad husband, and I let them stay the night. I felt like all night. Okay, (laughs) praise the Lord. (laughs) But how many knows when, when you handle God's visit correctly, it doesn't feel like labor. Now, you know, th- here's the thing about a visitation from the Lord. Nothing is so wonderful and so exhausting as a visitation from heaven. It will refresh your spirit and wear your body out. But man, don't it feel good when it's over? Amen. Why do you think we have something called the charismatic nap? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Number four, write this down. When we serve man and pursue God, it becomes an invitation for him to stay. When we serve, God, serve man and pursue God, it becomes an invitation for him to stay. This is what we are after. We are not after the short term, Jesus showed up, that was wonderful. Now we can go about our lives as if nothing changed. We're looking for him To not just see that this is a place he wants to visit, but that the visitation will turn into a habitation. And that I I I want us to leave the mentality of we want a visitation from heaven. And I want us to embrace we want heaven to inhabit this place. I mean, how many want to move from visitation to habitation? Y'all understand what that that's like? I mean, you, we've all, again, we've all had that visit where somebody acted like they were going to move in, and we're like, oh, dear God, no. Uh, but then how many have had those visits from people, and you are sad that they left? It, like, almost grieving that they left. That This is the way it should be. We should want so much for a visitation to turn to a habitation that we never want his presence to not be here. And when we understand this is not our church, This is his house. And we have not invited him in. He has invited us in. And he is the one that has extended the the invitation. Come on in. Come on in because he's here. Amen. So. I want to give you four things. For when visitation becomes habitation. Number one. When visitation becomes habitation, a moment becomes an expectation. A moment becomes an expectation. When visitation becomes habitation, then instead of, wow, I had a moment with God, now I'm changed, it becomes an expectation of every time I come to church, there's going to be another moment. There's going to be another moment. And the house becomes a place 
where we believe if I can just get to the house, I'll have the moment. That's the expectation. Number two, Jesus becomes the center of it all when visitation becomes habitation. Now, when Jesus has not visited and the visitation has not become a habitation, I have found that to be an atmosphere where Jesus is not the center of it all. A man's personality is at the center of it all. A program is at the center of it all. Good works is at the center of it all. But it's not Jesus at the center of it all. That's the real difference between a move of God and a nice church. That's the real difference. I don't want just a nice local church. I want a move of God in a place where everything revolves around Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you go to a church growth seminar as a pastor, and they'll tell you if you want to grow your church, have this program, have this speaker, do this in the spring, do this in the summer, and on and on and on. And Jesus isn't the center of their methods. Man's efforts is at the center of their methods. But when Jesus is at the center of it all, everything is different. How do we get there? I want you to write this down. Two things. Number one, let the sacred be the sacred. Do not make the carnal thing sacred. I'll give you an example. There was a church whose founding pastors died long before this other pastor showed up. And the church began to grow under this new pastor and people started to get excited. And so in an ill-advised move, some of the newer people got excited and wanted to honor the new pastor. So they took the hanging portrait of the founding pastor off the wall and went and hid it in a room that was never visited. And the long-standing members lost their eye teeth over it, and it turned into a church-wide fight over a hanging picture. Are you, are you hearing the words that I'm saying? What is that a picture of? That is taking the non-sacred and making it holy. I was once in a church meeting where the church split. People fought, I mean, fought with one another over ca carpet color. I saw a church split because the pastor painted a hallway blue. What am I talking about? I'm talking about let the sacred stuff remain sacred. And number two, write this down. Do not put stuff on a pedestal. If you want a habitation of God, don't make stuff holy. And it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. I was in a church service once, and um, the pastor had uh, made the decision not to have communion available in the gold plates. He just put the communion cups in a basket and said, everybody come grab one. And half the church said that communion became carnal because they didn't have their gold plates. This is the foolishness that some churches fight over. Why? Because they try to make stuff sacred. Stuff isn't sacred. The presence of God is sacred. The moving of the Holy Spirit is sacred. The preaching of the gospel is sacred. The worship in spirit and in truth, that's sacred. But some of this other stuff that people make sacred, I mean, you don't understand how much Kimberly and I thank God for this church. Because I'm telling you, when this happens, you know, the enemy just sits back, throws his head back, and laughs at the church when we are killing each other over stuff that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? 
And God's just sitting there, hey, you guys care more about the gold plates than I do. That's what God is saying to him. Right? You, got, you think God cares about the color of the carpet? I've actually seen people break friendships because they couldn't agree on the color of the carpet in a church building. How is this a place that God would say, I not only want to visit, I want to move in if we're fighting over the carnal? Amen? So say it with me. Keep the sacred sacred. Amen? Keep the sacred stuff sacred. And do, do not ever go down that road where you start to argue and fight over stuff. You know why? Because the Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall remain. The word is what's sacred, not, not stuff. Not stuff. But you don't understand, Pastor. It's the church. No, we are the church. This stuff doesn't matter. These chairs, this carpet, these walls, these lights, this platform, this pulpit, these things are not sacred. This thing is not sacred. What is said behind this thing is sacred. This is just iron. It's metal. It's not sacred. Are you, are you with me? Some of y'all looking at me like a cow at a new gate. What's that doing here? You know, but you understand the point I'm trying to say? And I'm not saying that these are our issues. I'm saying don't ever let it become our issues that we would ever fight over things that don't matter. You know, and we should never be fighting with one another in the first place. We should be fighting for each other. Stand in each other's corner. Amen? All right. This is going over very well. Number one, a moment becomes an expectation. Number two, Jesus becomes the center of it all. Number three, encounter turns into evangelism. When visitation becomes habitation, encounter turns into evangelism. John chapter 4, verse 28. John chapter 4, verse 28. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well. Pastor Mark preached the life out of this, and so I'm not going to go there, but I do want to point out one thing in verse number 28. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They went out of the city and came to him. When you have a habitation of the presence of God, encounters turn into evangelism do you remember what prophet doug parker said to us that god that what god was releasing over this house was the phrase come and see say that with me come and see when you have an encounter if in order for it to turn into a habitation you cannot keep the news of the encounter to yourself but let your encounter turn into evangelism run out into the highways and the byways jesus said and say come and see Amen. Don't go down the road of arguing with somebody who doesn't believe in your encounter. Say, you know what? I'm not here to convince you of anything. Just come and see for yourself. Amen. Don't come see a pastor. Come and see what God is doing in the building. That's all I'm going to say. Come and see. Just come and see. Well, you know, somebody had, somebody had asked me. I, I, I got a phone call uh, from another pastor who uh, heard of what God was doing in this place in the lives of people. He said, it sounds to me like revival has come to your church. And I said, that would be an accurate depiction. And he said, tell me about it. I said, what do you want to know about it? He said, I want to know about worship. I want to know about what you're preaching. I want to know about the altar calls. I want to know about lives that are changed. I want to know about the testimonies. And I said, my friend... I could explain all that to you, but why don't you get somebody to fill in your pulpit and you come see for yourself? Just come and see. You know, Doug Parker said something to me a couple of weeks ago, and I laughed at him to scorn, honestly. I was like, you're so full of it. He goes, no, he goes you, need to, he said, you need to listen to me. Doug Parker said to me, he said, God is doing something in your church, and God is doing something in your community. God is doing something in that house. And I said, amen to that. And he's like, you know, all of legacy needs to come 
and get a touch of victory. And I went, I said, brother, no. <laughs> He's like, no. He goes, you need to listen to me. He said, I foresee. He goes, he said, he said, Pastor Tim, there's a day coming when you and Kimberly and Dusty and whoever else will not be the ones flying out to the next legacy thing. It's time for all the legacy to fly out to Missouri and come and get some for themselves. And I just laughed at him. I said, you're ridiculous. Don't you clap at that. I said, you're ridiculous. <laughs> Y'all want to know the end of the conversation? I said to him, I said, you're ridiculous. I said, I said, brother, I said, listen. I said, Fulton doesn't have the hotels. Fulton does not have the restaurants. We cannot accommodate a group like that. He said, but you've got chairs in the building. You've got space. He's like, we need to come. He said, I've already told Bishop, we've got to go to Victory Fellowship. We need to take all of Legacy there. And I was like, I said, the and I just started laughing. I said, the only way any of this happens is everybody would have to be willing to get accommodations in Jefferson City or Columbia and drive 20 to 30 minutes from their hotel to each service and that's two to three trips a day that's a lot of gas and I said I I said I just don't see it and he said pastor Tim pastor Tim pastor Tim he said I've said it before I'll say it again he said not just legacy he said but there are more who need to come and see so, what do you, are you going to argue with a prophet? <laughs> Traffic jams, that's it. And so, I'm not saying that that's going to happen anytime soon. I think we've got a lot to adjust and a lot to grow and a lot to do to be able to accommodate something like that. But I can tell you this, I do believe there is coming a day, just as an example, when all of Legacy comes out here, because they, they do need to come and see. And I, and I told to Doug Parker, it needs to be more than a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I see it. It needs to be like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because all of them need to get up in here on a Sunday morning. And I would love to see all my legacy brothers and sisters get up here and get drunk in the Holy Ghost and get prophesied to. That's that's really what they need. They just don't need another location. They need an encounter. Anyway, I don't know why I told you all that. <laughs> Other than when you have an encounter with God, don't Hold it to yourself. Evangelize with it. Go tell somebody, you, you're not going to believe what God did for me Sunday morning. You're not going to believe what God did to me Wednesday night. What happened? Well, I could explain it to you. I'll try, but you might not get it, so you should just come and see for yourself. Do you know that goes a long way? And I'm going to show you what happens when you learn how to do that. Number four, seasons of rain become perpetual overflow. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. In verse 14, we're not going to go to verse 14. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, then I'll forgive their sin, then I will heal their land. Verse 15 says this. Watch this. Now, verse 14 describes revival. Verse 15 dis describes the perpetual overflow of that move. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayers of this place. Verse 16. So now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name be there continually. My heart and my, my eyes and my heart will be there for all days. This is moving from visiting to habiting to inhabiting a physical location. God said in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 over Solomon's temple, not only will my fire fall, not only will my rain come to a place like that, a visitation, but now my eyes, my ears, and my heart will be established in that house forever. Perpetual. Say perpetual. Do you understand what a perpetual move of God is? That's habitation. Right? It doesn't mean you go from a good Sunday to an off Sunday. It means, and tell me if you've witnessed this, each week 
seems like it builds on the last one. And it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And if you've never experienced that, and I, I understand, I'm, I probably sound goofy to some people tonight, but that's okay. This is why people say, I felt it in the parking lot. I felt it before the very first song. Why? Because there's a continual, there's a, per, there's a perpetual move to it. So you shouldn't come every Sunday needing to stir it all up. Literally, as you walk into the building, it's in the room. Amen? Are you with me? This is what it means to move into a habitation. So what happens? You're almost there. You're going to make it. I'm going to explain everything in just a second. What happens when the presence of God moves into a house and he says, my eyes, my heart, and my ears are there forever? I will be attentive to prayers made in that place. I will see what is happening in this place. I will listen to what is being said in this place. Do you understand that's what the Bible says? And the Lord was working with them, confirming his word with accompanying signs. Is because when the church gives him something to say amen to, and his ears are attentive to the things that are being said, then he moves and gives confirmation to the things he hears because his attention is on the house. Isn't that what we want? Amen? When I give an altar call, I never, I, I'm never sitting here thinking, okay, I invited people to come to get delivered from this. God, I hope this works. <laughs> that was me at 16. But now I've been in this thing 31 years. And I know whatever he calls out is for a reason. He's going to do it because his ears are open. His eyes are open to what is happening in this place. I believe, what did he say? He said that there would be a house and I will establish my name there. Do you understand that's what God is doing here? God is establishing his name here. In every church will either have his name or it will have the word Ichabod written over its doorpost. The word Ichabod means the glory has departed. But when his name is there, then his character is there. His love is there. His power is there. His presence is there. His glory is there. I don't want Ichabod. The glory's departed. I want, I want, I want Jehovah written over this place. I want Yahweh written over this place. Come on. I want, because this is not our house. Look at somebody and say, this ain't your church. This is his house. Amen. You know, if I visit your house, even though you tell me make myself at home, I won't. Because some people can't handle it if I make myself at home. Okay. But my house is a different story. I do whatever I want to in my house. I eat what I want to, as long as my wife's okay with it. <laughs> in my house. I can't get no honest husbands in this place right now. Huh? I eat, I, you know, I'd like to say, I do whatever I want in my house. Thin reason. I can't get no help in here, baby. I'm, I'm on an island. Ain't no husband willing to say, I know, Pastor, I feel you. Okay, okay, so when the presence, when the presence of God moves in, it goes from being your house to his house. And when it's his house, he does whatever he wants to. He ain't got to ask his wife. He does, he does whatever he wants to. Amen. How many are thankful for that? God does whatever he wants to. Okay, so what happens when God moves in, number one, his presence becomes the culture and the DNA of the house. Okay, so there, there are things all over my house that, that reeks isn't the right word, emanates my wife's DNA, her culture, the culture of my, not her physical DNA. Y'all are getting weird. Y'all don't understand what I'm saying? When I walk into your house, your house emanates who dwells there. So when you walk into my house, 
the inside of my house, it emanates what my wife is comprised of, her personality, her taste, etc., etc. You walk out into the back patio, there's my DNA and culture, right? Y'all understand what I'm saying? So then, it, but if God moves in to a house, this house, this house should not emanate the DNA of Tim and Kimberly. It should emanate the DNA of Jehovah God Almighty. Are you with me? This house should not emanate the DNA of my board and my elders and my leaders and my volunteers. We all should be emanating the DNA and the culture of Jesus Christ himself. This is what I'm trying to say. So when he moves in, the culture of the house becomes his DNA. It's his DNA, his culture, his personality is what shines through. Number two, when he moves in, people are drawn to him. No man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. I believe this is why people have been drawn. I don't remember the last time we had a Sunday where we did not have a first-time guest. People are being drawn. Not because of my preaching. Not because of their singing. Not because of all the other good stuff that happens here. But because the presence of God is in this place. Come on, can I get an amen to that? Amen. Number three, when he moves in, his love moves through his people. His love moves through his people. Can I tell you, more, almost, almost more than anything else, I believe that's what people need to experience, is the love of God through people. I do, they, they should not in, experience our carnality. We will all have an off day. The best of us will have a, we'll have a bad day. You know, we, we'll have a day when we honestly shouldn't even be serving. I can't get no honest Christians in here to say, you know what I'm talking about. We, we all have a bad day. We, we all have a day when we're like, oh, people shouldn't talk to me today. Do I got any honest people in here at all? You know what I'm saying? It's like, mm, mm. It's like you, you get up in the morning, you're like, nope, I better roll out on the other side. This is not a good start. But can I tell you more than not? When people encounter you, they should be encountering the love of God. Not, not, not a fake putting on, but an authentic love. An authentic love. Do you know? It's one of the reasons I love to get up and say, we'll continue the service in a moment, but everybody go out and find whatever stupid number I come up with. You, you go find yourself 27 people, whatever the number is. And I love to hear it because I'm not hearing anything fake under this roof. I hear an authentic expression of love. And you know what I hear a lot of? Laughter. Yeah. Hugging high-fiving, laughing, not at anybody's expense. It's what I said Sunday. It's the sound of being jubilant, a joyful sound in the room. Amen? Amen. Number four, when God moves into the house, His power is present. Demons can't stay in people when His power is present. The sick can't remain sick when his power is present the lost can't stay lost the addicted can't stay addicted when his power is present i have asked god to so permeate this building that it becomes impossible for anybody with an incurable disease to go home with an incurable disease to be so filled with the power of God in this room, impossibilities become possible. Death sentences are removed and life is given. 
it is my prayer that even the reputation of the house through our city will be, oh, you want to get rid of that? Go to victory. Because when his power is present, I'm telling you, this is what happens. Number five, I'll do this quickly because y'all, y'all get this. <coughs> the atmosphere is infused. The atmosphere is infused with four things. Celebration, worship, expectation, and faith. I had, we had a Sunday several Sundays ago. I'm back in my office getting my mind right. Working on memorizing a couple of scriptures and getting my mind fixed on what it is that God wants me to do. Dusty runs back to my office. I was the only one in there at the moment. And he says, Pastor. And his eyes, I mean, his eyes are bugged out. Shaking his head. And Dusty said, there's a sound out there. He goes, something's happening today. And I usually joke with him. I'm like, Dusty, we're probably getting out of here in like 90 minutes. And he's like, you didn't hear what I heard. Something's happening today. And it's because our atmosphere. Okay, well, let me say it this way. Our atmosphere now, as compared to what it was four years ago, is completely different. It's like you walk in here. And it's either the sound of love. Or it's the sound of celebration, worship, faith, and expectation. Like, whoo! something's gonna happen i mean my phone will start blowing up while i'm sitting in my office from different people talking about oh get ready get ready something's happening today this is what i'm talking about when he moves in it changes the sound of the atmosphere when it changes the sound of the atmosphere and i'm going to tell you next week next week judah will be at camp Some of y'all know where I'm going with this. The sound in my home will change next week. Everybody be quiet. That's next week. Next weekend when they come back from camp, the atmosphere in my home will be infused with Let me tell you something, Dad. Okay? Now, that's the life of God within him. Now, Jillian, Jillian's different. Jillian, this week, my house will have the same sound as it will next week when she's at camp. Because unless... She had too much <laughs> caffeine at work. She's quiet as a little church mouse. Okay? Now, Josiah, his sound depends on the day. You know, to where he can be very quiet. Or it could be, bruh! <laughs> okay? Watch this now. When God moves in, your atmosphere becomes infused with a sound. But watch this. It's not him making the sound. It's the impact of him through you that creates the sound that infuses the atmosphere. We had a guy. Let me just say this real quick. I'm almost done. We had a guy that came to service a few weeks ago who doesn't come all the time, yet. And he said to somebody, I've never been to a church whose atmosphere stays up like this every time I come. He said, this is the only church that its atmosphere stays consistent. Let me explain to you why. Because when you and I walk in here this Sunday morning, 
we're not walking in here wondering if God's going to do something, hoping that God will do something. We walk in here knowing God's going to do something in somebody. It might not be my life. Somebody's getting touched today. When we become expectant and determined, well, they're not going to get it and me not get it. Amen? Then we'll, cha we'll change from, well, somebody's going to get it. I don't know who. And it will change from, I'm getting it. I ain't leaving until I get it. I don't care what pastor says. We are not dismissed till I get it. That's expectation. Amen? Let me close with this. Number six. When God moves in, great joy spreads in the city. Go to Acts chapter 8. Philip, verse 5, went down to the main city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miracles that he did, they listened in unity to what he said. For devils, unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, how many have witnessed this? Okay, if you haven't witnessed it, you haven't been here for five weeks. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed, also are delivered from people that are not possessed but oppressed. And many who were paralyzed or lame got healed. Verse 8. So there was much joy in the city. What is described for us in Acts chapter 8 is what can happen to a church when God moves in. When visitation becomes habitation. Watch this. The gospel's preached. The very first thing that we see is as Philip preaches, the people were in unity. After he preached, he started casting out devils, and they started to see the lame and the paralyzed completely healed. And there was great joy in the city. Can I tell you something? Sunday we talked about Jubilee brings joy. What is Jubilee? The captive are set free. Huh? The captive are set free. That is what Philip saw, the captive being set free. He saw unclean spirits coming out and the lame and the paralyzed completely healed. When they got their Jubilee, they were filled with great joy. And they didn't keep their joy to a minimum. They ran out to the whole city. What happens when the presence of God moves in like this? People in the city begin to believe. Well, if it happened for them, what could happen to me? And then there's great joy. What are you talking about great joy? What do you think is going to happen to a bunch of demon-possessed, lame, paralyzed people that get set free with the spirit of Jubilee? They're going to make a sound. Amen? How many want that kind of joy? Because I can tell you, that's what landed the apostles in prison. Because the Pharisees didn't want their city filled with great joy. We've got to be determined no matter what. The captive will be set free. The lame will get healed. The paralyzed will walk again in Jesus' name. Amen. Why? Not because of us, but because a visitation becomes a habitation. Now, there has been much said about what revival is and what revival is not. There has been much said to you as to what man thinks a move of God is. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, a real move of God is not something that happens periodically. A real move of God, first and foremost, saves the lost. And if you say you have revival but nobody's getting saved, what you have is renewal, but it's not revival. Because, and I, and I just gonna want to say this, I'm not, I'm not. This, this is not anything political. 
the United States of America needs to be revived and it needs to be renewed and awakened. And it does not start with November. It starts Sunday morning in the church house. And the dead churches have got to become alive again. And those that are on the fence need to be renewed and refreshed. But real revival, real revival does not impact the church. It impacts the city. And, and, if, and if all we have here is a move of God that causes us to get excited, we've not yet tapped into real revival. Real revival is we'll st- <laughs> I hate to even say it. Is when we start seeing city councilmen and mayors and the governor and people of influence come in, not to sit in the seat of honor, but to get on their face in the altar and have an encounter with Jesus Christ. That's real revival. When, when, when we know we've got a real move of God is when the people of influence over the city of Fulton and over the county of Callaway get on fire for God and their policies begin to reflect it. Then you'll know we've had revival. What did Apostle Paul say when he stood, when he stood in front of Felix and he said this? You almost convinced me to believe. I'm a little surprised the Apostle Paul didn't just go lay hands. I don't know. God didn't tell him to. This is what I want. I'm not interested in politicians who say they're devout. I'm interested in seeing politicians that are on fire for God. And their life reflects it. And can I tell you, their speech reflects it. They're not just saying something, they're living something. This is what I want to see. And I pray before the day Jesus returns, we will see a move of God hit Washington, D.C. that will shake this nation. Come on, will you pray with me for that? Amen. I mean, wouldn't you just love? There's no chance this ever gets to him. But wouldn't you just love to turn on the local news and Governor Parson open his mouth and can only speak in tongues? Okay, stand to your feet. Pastor Tim, that sounds radical. I'm a radical guy. And I don't care how God has to do it. I just want God to do it. I want God, first and foremost, first of all, God, God, God will not shake our city until he's first shaken our churches. The church is the life and the expression of God himself. And so we've got to be on fire, and we have got to have a place that he will call his own, that he will not just visit, but that he'll move in, and that this will be his house. Amen. Come on, will you lift your hands? Just pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we call on you, almighty God. I pray that you will move in this place by your spirit like never before. Father, I pray for uncommon revival. I pray for uncommon favor, for uncommon blessing. I pray, God, for the United States of America. God, that you would revive our people. That, God, every wall of division and dissension within the political world would be torn down and that you would breathe unity upon your people once again. Lord, we pray for every church, every church in this community, God, that they would begin to burn with the flames of revival. Lord, we pray God, that you would change lives in Jesus' name. God, let there be great joy in this city for what you are doing in Jesus' name. Lord, we are not believing you to recycle the past. But God, we are believing you in Jesus' name to do what you have never done before. To move in a way you have never moved before. 
in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, we open up our hearts and we receive from you tonight, God, in the name of Jesus. Not by might nor by power.